Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> I asked Tom to lead us in that hymn uh, this morning <clears throat> because I wanted to try to bring a message to you from Psalm 139, and I've titled it, Come Ye Sinners. Come Ye Sinners. <clears throat> Psalm 139, the Lord is telling us that he knows everything about us better than we could ever possibly know ourselves. And he does not tell us this as a threat or a warning. He tells us this as an enticement to say to us, come. <laughs> I already know it all. And in spite of that, I love you. And I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Why would you allow conscience to cause you to linger? Is it not shame and guilt and fear that caused Adam to hide from God? And is that not the same thing that works in our hearts that causes us to be reluctant to come to him? And here in our text, the Lord is, the Lord is saying to us, I already know everything. Better than you do. I know every thought you've ever had. I know everything you've ever done. And if I was a man, you would avoid me because you'd be ashamed. But I'm not a man. I'm not a man. I'm God. And in spite of all of that, I've demonstrated my love for you. And it's the goodness of God that leadeth to repentance. Isn't that a, there's such freedom in that. There's such liberty to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace, knowing that, you know, the Lord's not saying, he's not just saying, I know everything about you because I'm omniscient. That's true. He knows everything. But he's saying to those who are his, I know everything about you experientially. For I bore in my body upon that tree all the sins of all of my people. Guilt, shame, fear, rejection. You think you know what that is? <laughs> oh, I know so much better than you do. And I was forsaken of my father so that you would not have to be. Now that's what Psalm 139, that's what the Lord's telling us. He's enticing us to come to him. He's saying to us, you, you don't have to hide anymore. <laughs> you don't have to pretend. <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to be with me like you are with one another. I know everything. Not just because I'm omniscient, but I've experienced it. I've experienced it in a way that you could never experience it. Not a, not a blessing. All right, let's, let's pray together and ask the, Lord's, ask the Lord's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the revelation of your grace and your love and your mercy towards your people. We thank you for the accomplished work of thy dear Son, and oh, how we pray this morning, Lord, that you'd be pleased to draw us to yourself, to cause us, Lord, to come unto thee. For truly the burden and the weight of our sin is greater than we can bear. But what hope we have in knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions, that he bore the full weight of your wrath and your judgment, suffered the full shame and guilt and, and fear that sin brings. And Lord, we, we thank you that the spirit and the bride says to sinners, come ye sinners, come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Lord, bless your word. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We 
guard ourselves with men, <clears throat> lest someone know too much about us and be offended. And that's a good thing. No one wants to see all your warts. You don't want to see mine. Uh, we should be that way with one another. <clears throat> but our God is not a man. <clears throat> with men, we ought to guard our speech. It's a good thing to have a filter between your mind and your mouth. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, scripture says in Proverbs chapter 29, a fool uttereth all that is in his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till afterwards. Could you imagine the chaos, the conflict, <laughs> the havoc that would take place in this room? <laughs> much less in the world, if we were able to know each other's deepest thoughts? No, no, we don't want to know that. I don't want to know yours, and you don't want to know mine. But our God is not a man, and we don't relate to him the same way we relate to one another. What abuse men would inflict on each other if they knew one another's true fears or if they knew everything that another man has ever thought or done. What advantage we would take care of each other. And yet, just the opposite is true when it comes to our God. We bear our souls with him. We, we pour out our deepest desires, our deepest needs, our deepest, most secret sins, and, and the Lord has mercy on us, and he loves us in spite of these things. He doesn't take advantage of us. He doesn't uh, forsake us because of our sin. No, just the opposite is true. And that's what, that's what he's saying here. Turn, turn back with me. Let's begin in Psalm 73. I want to show you something here in Psalm 73. <clears throat> David, in Psalm 73, I'm sorry, Asaph. Asaph, in Psalm 73, begins by saying, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Who shall stand in his presence? He that has pure hands and a clean heart. That's, those are the ones that kind of come into the presence of God. How am I going to have that? Well, look what Asaph says in the next verse. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I looked at other men and I... My heart wasn't right with God. It wasn't right. I, I was jealous. I was fearful. I was, I was covetous of what others had. I look at verse 14. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. <laughs> I've been plagued by this sinful covetous heart and every morning I wake up feeling guilty and if I say now here's what I want you to see look at verse 15 if I say I will speak thus behold I should offend against the generation of thy children if I try to if I try to resolve this problem with another man and tell him what's really going on in my heart all I'm going to do is make him to stumble he can't help me that's, uh, you know, people try to resolve their, their guilt issues and their shame with, uh, with another man. They go to a therapist and they, they can't help you. <laughs> and they're not going to be able to. All you, 
Look at, look at the next verse. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Where am I going to go? How am I going to resolve this, this hard problem that I have? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Until I came to Christ, I came to the place where his gospel was preached, and I realized that I have a God who knows everything about them and knows everything about me. <laughs> Look what he says. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou casteth them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors? As a dream when one waketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reign. So foolish was I, and ignorant I was as a beast before thee. You ever feel like that? <laughs> Asaph said, I was, I was like a wild animal before God. Nevertheless, nevertheless, in spite of these sins of my heart, in spite of that, nevertheless... I am continually with thee. Now, that's what Psalm 139 is all about. In spite of the fact that I'm this way, in spite of the fact that I've got this, this wicked, covetous thought, mind, and heart, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by, my right, by thy right hand, or by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterwards receive me to glory. <laughs> In spite of, that's a good definition of grace, isn't it? In spite of. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Nobody can help me with this sin problem I have. Come ye sinners, weak and wounded, come. Come to the throne of grace with boldness, with confidence, knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ as our forerunner has gone before us. He's sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. He's, he's experienced the full shame of every sin of every one of God's people. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You see, the Lord's telling us that you can't help yourself and no man can help you. And I know everything there is to know about you. I know every thought you've ever had, everything you've ever done. And I love you. And I know it not just because I'm omniscient, but because I experienced it. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. <laughs> it is good for me that I draw near unto God. Why won't men come to Christ? The Lord answers that question for us. Turn to me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Light. <laughs> what does light do? It exposes everything. You turn the lights on and and what could not be seen in the dark is now fully exposed. Light is coming to the world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And he says here, light is coming to the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. 
The irreligious, immoral man will not come to the light of the gospel because he's indulging his flesh and his sin doesn't want anybody, doesn't want anybody to tell him what to do. The religious, self-righteous man won't come to Christ because his, his, his iniquity will be exposed for what it is. His works will be exposed for what they are, filthy rags, and he will not come. Well, the Lord said, you won't come to me because you're going to be exposed. You're going to be reproved. You're going to be uh, shown for what you are. But, verse 21, he that doeth truth, he that loves the truth, shall come to the light. He comes. Lord, I, I need to be exposed. I, I need for you to. You see, what men cover, God will uncover. And whatever we uncover, God covers. Isn't that the way it works? Just come, Lord, here I am. <laughs> all my sin, all my shame. Lord, you've already, you've already seen it all. You, you know it all. And the hope that I have is that you've experienced in infinitely more than what I've known in my experience in terms of the real horror of my sin. He that doeth the truth cometh to light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. <laughs> Repentance is a work of grace. Faith is a work of grace. Coming to Christ is a work of grace. Loving the truth is a work of grace. And when we're able by the grace of God to come to Christ, then it's evident that, that this, is, this is wrought of God. This is God's work in me. It is God that works in me, causing me to will and to do after his good pleasure. Psalm 44, verse 21 says, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. <laughs> Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks upon the heart. You say, oh, that's, a, that's an intimidating thought. No, it ought not to be. It ought not to be. Because he's, he says, I, I, I know you. I know everything about you. And he looks upon us like he looked on Peter that night after being, after being flogged. And it, he, he set his eyes on Peter, didn't he? <laughs> after he told Peter, he said, Peter, before, this, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he didn't look at Peter with a look of disgust. He didn't look at him with disappointment. He didn't look at him with... You know, see, I told you so. No, when Peter fixed his eyes on our Lord's eyes, all he saw in his eyes was compassion. And Peter wept bitterly. You see, it is the love of God that constraineth us. It is the goodness of God that leadeth us to repentance. What the Lord is telling us over and over again is, I'm not a man. I'm not like you. I'm not like you. If other men knew you the way I knew you, they wouldn't have anything to do with you. But just the opposite is true with me. <laughs> As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. I have a, I have a pity and a love and compassion for you because of what I know about you and because of what I've experienced for you. Come. <laughs> Come. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, come. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. We bear the burden of a guilty conscience and of fear and shame. And the Lord's saying, come, I'll take that. I've taken that. Here's what the Lord's saying. If, I be for, if God be for me, 
If God be for me, who can be against me? He knows us. Turn, turn me to Galatians chapter 4. I say, preacher, we haven't even got to our text yet. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 8, how be it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. <laughs> Before you knew God, you served the idols of your own darkened imagination. But now, how be it then when you knew not God, you did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after the, you have known God, or rather are known of God. <laughs> oh, we know him in part, don't we? We know him in part. He knows us in whole. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? <laughs> you're, you're known of God. You're known of God. He... He's a God of liberty. He's a God of freedom. He's a God of grace and love and mercy. And all of that is available. All of that is, is, is true. I didn't mean to say available. All that's true because he's a God of justice. And he satisfied his holy justice at Calvary's cross. And so the Lord is saying, I, I've already... I've already paid for that. You see, when we allow conscience to cause us to linger, as we just sang, when we, when we use guilt and shame, all we're doing is, is, is denying the finished work of Christ. And we're, we're, in essence, trying to do penance for our sin, are we not? <laughs> it, it, All right, let's go, let's go to our, our text. Let's just read a few of these verses. It's a long psalm. And, oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. <laughs> the Lord knew exactly which tree Adam was hiding behind. <laughs> when he said, Adam, where art thou? He wasn't asking that for his own information. He was exposing Adam, Lord, thou hast searched me, thou hast known me. You know where I'm at. You know how I'm sewing together fig leaves, trying to hide my nakedness. And the Lord's saying, it's not working. Come. Come out of there. Get out from behind that tree. There's a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, and his fleece will provide for you a a hiding place, a covering. His righteousness will be sufficient to satisfy everything that I require of you. And he'll get all the glory for having put away your sin and having, having made himself an offering for sin and perfected forever them which are sanctified. What hope? <laughs> That's what the... I can remember reading Psalm 139 years ago, and I thought, boy, this is true. <laughs> but it's not, God's not saying this in order to shame us. He's not saying it, just the opposite. It's just the opposite. He's saying this in order to entice us to come to him. Don't, don't allow your, don't allow anything to keep you from Christ. <laughs> Light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because the light reproves them. It exposes them. And that's what we need. Look at verse 2. Thou knowest my down-sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. <laughs> oh, we don't understand our own thoughts, do we? Why do I think that? What am I, where's that coming from? And what, what is really the motive behind all of that? And we don't understand ourselves. <laughs> you remember back in the 70s, what we did was navel gazing, saying what we're trying to find ourselves. <laughs> you, know? you ever do that? <laughs> no, we never did. And I haven't yet. You don't know yourself. 
You don't know why you think what you think. You don't know why you do what you do. You don't know why you say what you say. But here's the good news. Our God knows. He knows every nuance and every motive and every, everything in every thought before we thank them. <laughs> Thou can passeth my path with, thy li- with my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. <laughs> Lord, you're acquainted with everything about me. You know it all and you know it all perfectly and you know it all experientially for there is not a word in my mouth but lord oh lord, oh lo oh, oh lord thou knowest it all together oh how many foolish words we've spoken how many things we wish we could take back and we speak out of anger and out of fear and and the Lord says I I know (laughs) I know every word you've ever spoken I know why you said it I know everything about it it's okay come come you sinner come you sinner I love you that sin's been God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Is this not what keeps us from Christ? Is it not what keeps us from coming to Christ thinking that he's like another man? He thought that I was altogether such a one as thyself. Surely you wouldn't come to another man. You would do everything you could to avoid another man who knew every secret of your life and heart and mind and thought. If you knew it was going to be in that room, you wouldn't go in that room. You'd go somewhere else. You'd hide from him. The Lord's saying, I'm not a man. I'm not a man. I've already already taken care of that. (laughs) I've proven my love for you by bearing the real shame and guilt and fear of all of that. I know you. I know your thoughts. I know your down rising, your up rising, your down sitting. I know when you go to bed. I know when you get up. I know everything. (laughs) Why are you hiding? (laughs) Why are you trying to find a hiding place in the law or in your works or in, in your will or in something else? No, God has made the Lord Jesus Christ to be our hiding place. A man shall be your hiding place. He shall be the covert from the storm. And David says in Psalm 6, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. (laughs) Lord, I, I can't. I can't comprehend this whither shall I go from thy spirit Lord I'm always prone to wander I'm always prone to leave the God that I love I'm always I'm always trying to wander away from you I'm constantly diverting my attention my eyes away from you to something else but whither can I go from thy spirit when I depart from you you never depart from me he said I'll never leave you nor forsake you you know, we get, we get right to the precipice, but God's got his children on a leash. You know, he, he, won't, he won't allow them to, to fall into destruction. Where can I, where can I go from thy, from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? This is a good thing. Lord, I can't, I can't get away from you. (laughs) You're always there. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I have a wonderful time of prayer and worship and, and 
experience with God and glory. Lord, I, you're there. And if I go down into hell, you're there too. I find myself in the darkest pits of my own unbelief. Lord, you're there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, I find myself in the, in the turbulence of this world. What did we see last week? The way of the ship in the sea is the, is the church. And the way, of the, the way of the Lord is through the seas. And the turbulence of this world is... And, the Lord, and what's he saying? Lord, you're there with me. <laughs> Those disciples, when they, when they, when the Lord was asleep and they were about to, I mean, these were experienced fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. They were about to die in a storm. Lord, care us not that, I, that we perish. Wake up. <laughs> oh, do you not remember the loaves and the fishes, what the Lord said? Why? Why do you not believe? And then what did the Lord do? He spoke and, oh, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the seas obey his voice? That's what the Lord's saying to us here. In your time of worship, in your darkest hour, in your time of turbulence and trials and troubles, I'll not leave you nor forsake you. You don't have to pretend. He, he, <laughs> the Lord called that Syrophoenician woman a dog, and once she say, "Truth, Lord, <laughs> truth, Lord," yeah, you know, you know me, you know me. And Lord, if you could just scrape one crumb off of your table, one crumb from God's table is more than uh, more than all the feasts that this world has to offer. Or the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And that woman at the well, don't you love when the disciples came back and they tried to get the Lord? They'd been down in Sychar. They had the Son of God with them. They left him there at the well. They never mentioned to anybody in the city that he was there. They were just Samaritans. They came back with lunch. Try to get him to eat. What did the Lord say? Have meat to eat that you know not of. <laughs> you, don't, you don't understand this, this meat that I have. For my meat. It's what are you going on to say? My meat is to do the will of the Father which sent me and to finish the work. That's my meat. <laughs> and this woman ran back to town. I mean, the reason why she was at the well in the middle of the day is because she couldn't go in the mornings when all the other women were there in the cool of the day because she had lived such a shameful life in town that I mean, she'd been married five times. And she was embarrassed. And that's who the Lord met. I must needs go through Samaria when the disciples tried to get him to go another way. I've got one of my lost sheep there that's dying of guilt and fear and shame for her sin, and I'm going to have mercy upon her. And she went back into town, and she did what those disciples didn't do. She went down through the streets. Come, <laughs> meet a man who told me everything I ever did. <laughs> Is not this the Christ? Meet a man who knows everything about you. Is not this the Christ? Come. That woman with the issue of blood, she was unclean, and she was supposed to declare herself unclean and was supposed to, I mean, we talk about social distancing uh, today. It was a very serious issue back then. If you were unclean, you had, to, you had to announce yourself to be unclean, and you could not get within certain distance of anybody else. And she saw the Lord, and he was, I mean, they were strong with people around him. She got on her hands and knees and crawled through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. Oh, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And, 
And the Lord said, who touched me? And the disciples said, Lord, everybody here is touching you. Oh, no, he said, virtue has gone out from me. Mercy and grace and healing has gone out from me. The scripture says she looked at him <laughs> and she told him all the truth. She told him all the truth. We come before God, just tell him all the truth. Tell him everything. And then you won't have touched the hem of his garment. <laughs> you won't have scratched the surface. You won't, have, you won't have seen but the tip of the iceberg if you tell him everything you know. What he knows is much more than that. When the, when, when the Lord rose from the dead, he told Mary, he said, he said uh, go tell the disciples and Peter <laughs> that I'm alive. Oh, Peter said, I go fishing. I've, I've messed it up. Peter was just living in such horrible shame and guilt and fear, I've ruined it. No way I can be saved now. And the Lord went to the sea of Peter, lovest thou me? Lovest thou me, Peter? Feed my sheep. And the third time, the scripture says that Peter was grieved because the Lord asked him the third time, lovest thou me? And Peter said, Lord, you know my heart. You know everything about me. And that's my comfort and that's my hope. That you know me. You know me. You don't know yourself. And we don't know each other. But God knows us perfectly. Oh, blind Bartimaeus. I, I can just see blind Bartimaeus. He never made a scene in his life. He was a poor, blind beggar who sat in the shadows and humbly begged for alms. And the scripture says that the Lord was leaving Jericho. That's what it says. He was leaving Jericho. He had already been in Jericho, and he was departing the city. And blind Bartimaeus knew, this is my only chance. This is my only chance. And he made a scene, and he cried out, the scripture says, with well, all of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. And what did the crowd do? Bartimaeus, get back in your place. Get back in your place. Look at you. You're a filthy, dirty, blind beggar. Get back in your place. And he cried all the louder. <laughs> Why? Because he knew that that was the Son of God. And that man knows everything about me. And if I have any hope of seeing and being healed, he's going to have to do it. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. David spent about at least nine months in shame and fear and guilt over what he had done with Bathsheba and most especially with Uriah. Adultery, murder. Tried to cover it up, tried to hide it. Till Nathan came to him. Oh, David, God knows everything about you. David, you're the man. And you read Psalm 51. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. Wash me thoroughly from my sins. Isaiah chapter 32. And we'll close with this. Turn with me to Isaiah 32, please. Verse 1, Behold, 
a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment, and a man, and a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and as a covert from the tempest, as the rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, and the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. Oh, why do you make your covenant with death, Isaiah 28, your hiding place? Why do you make the law your hiding place? Why do you make your, your, your guilty conscience your hiding place? And your, your penance your hiding place? Why do you make the things of this world? A man shall be your hiding place. And that's what the Lord's saying. I'm the covert from the storm. Come, ye sinners. Come, ye sinners. Poor and wretched. Weak and wounded. Sick and sore. Jesus stands ready to save you. Full of pity. <laughs> Full of pity joined with power. Amen.